Hi everyone, I'm Josh Rothis, I'm the publisher of Sublunary Editions, but today I'm coming to you as the translator of Benjamin Harness's Exercises, uh, published or translated from a 1927 volume called Ercisios. Um, this is a collection of 50 short meditations um, on art and literature and the role that they should play, uh, written by Harness in response to some of the dominant stylistic trends of his time. Uh, what's important about Harnais philosophically, he's um, an acolyte of Jose Ortega y Gasset, and he's writing from uh, very much from a place of Ortega's uh, perspectivism, an idea that uh, knowledge compounds over time via the perspectives of cultures, of individuals. And Harnais is talking about um, the artist is someone who is meant to refract experience, uh, to channel energies through them and um, relay those to the world, and it's through their unique perspective that art has its meaning. He takes as perhaps the prime example, not another writer, but Charlie Chaplin. So I'm going to read an extended section that's going to cross um, sections 23 and 24. He's going to talk about Chaplin's uh, The Gold Rush, and when I start, um, he's going to be referring to an unnamed he himself, and this is his personification of art. From 23. By limiting himself, he has amputated extraneous limbs, circumscribing around them a magical border that neither science nor craft can cross. When asked, he declared his insignificance. He was indifferent to being infiltrated by politics, under the guise of the good life. One day he stammered like a child, naively rereading the pages of the past and declared, also naively, that such a lesson was stupid and another incomprehensible. It doesn't matter that the people failed to greet him as they passed, like the princes of the Renaissance and the actors of the 18th century. He has lost all respect for himself and neither did he demand it from others. He looked calmly at himself in the mirror and learned to reject all excessive flourishes. He deliciously murdered tragedy and resolved to conceal her long hair. She left in peace the heavens and the earth, the forest and the seas, no longer guilty of any feminine intemperance. When Chaplin crosses the screen, all of his baggage, baggage accompanies him. Chaplin offers himself to us isolated, hermetic, inside the urn of his own creation, which is himself. I know nothing more antithetical to a virtuoso. Like the devotional icons of the bazaar, the virtuoso is always radiant, giving off bright and mellifluous rays. His emotion is a veritable spigot by which he sprinkles the rest of the actors and all of the dumbfounded spectators with radiant dewdrops. Chaplin gathers all the resonances of a scene into himself. He is a conduit of emotional energies. Yet he perennially gives us the impression of a man displaced, of a child lost in the crowd even though he can count himself among the definers of aesthetic law. Chaplin disdains all favor from the shifting reality which offers him at every step his glass of sentimental wine, taking from it ever the suspicious traveler, only the precise sips needed to be able to continue walking, to be able to continue dreaming. Chaplin is always dreaming. In the gold rush, he dreams essentially that he is surrounded by a group of his friends. To amuse them, he invents an innocent spectacle. He organizes a dance. Not a simple masquerade of the costumes of yesterday or tomorrow, but a childlike dance with dinner rolls. He is sitting at the table, extends his hands, and with the first thing he encounters, brings to life his brilliant idea. The same thing could, be, could have been done with a bowl of fruit or a napkin. Let us not leave a gold coin within the reach of the false artist, because he will return it to us, bartered for a sack of tarnished pennies. He is a bad agent of change. True art returns everything exchanged in the artist, because in him all matter enjoys the miracle of transubstantiation. We say Chaplin, but we might as well say Stravinsky or Picasso. All of them managed to turn humble dinner rolls into enchanted little fairy shoes. Into 24. The good dancer needs but one tile. Like a good novelist, he needs only a single gesture, or the absence of a gesture. Proust builds a magnificent architecture atop the fragile stone of a failed kiss. Chaplin links a subtle chain of emotions to a first bud, to a first shadow of emotion. It is in them that the limitation is creative. Voluntarily sunk into any open crack in the living rock, they continue to tear at the heart of the mountain until it is completely undermined by a wondrous tunnel. Instead of vaguely roaming the landscape, they aim their binoculars 
at a particular plot of land. On an excursion, the most curious traveler is always the one who has seen the fewest things because he was content to stop at just one. Non multa, sed multum, said the old masters. No one is a worse traveler than the owner of an ostentatious automobile. His trip consists in rapidity. It is itself art. And around the world of a novelist is the excursion of a colonialist who goes out to survey his novel plantations, gauging the next harvest. No one is less curious about the wonders of the earth than the farmer, just as no one is less curious about orographic beauty than the forestry engineer. A mountain climber is preferable. Fortunately, art is already learning to walk slowly, to pause, to underline any moment, any foreshortening. Chaplin, it seemed, was only trying to amuse us with a sleight of hand, but his lovely dinner rolls wove a subtle and unexpected scaffolding of midair. Out of no more than a humble meal, he created a graceful upwelling of bizarre.